Welcome to the Old School RuneScape Conspiracy Iceberg. This video is going to take you through all eight tiers of my Conspiracy Iceberg, using theories found across the internet, along with some of my own. This video will mostly stick to conspiracies and mysteries within the lore of the game, and will cover a wide range of topics. Now some of these topics will be verifiably true, some will be verifiably false and satirical, but plenty others will be left unsolved. Because there's a lot to cover, we won't get too deep into most of the theories, but I can go in-depth on a given theory in a later video if there's enough interest. Since this particular iceberg was created by me, I only included topics that I know enough to talk about, and omitted any theories about content creators which could reignite unnecessary drama. There will be some topics here that paint JX in a negative light, I limited these to keep the video from getting too negative, but I'd like to give a final disclaimer that I don't necessarily believe any of these theories to be true, I'm just relaying information for the sake of entertainment. Now if you're a super pro RuneScape player who isn't interested in the first couple of tiers because you'll obviously already know about all these, I've included timestamps for the start of each tier here. We'll now get into the top layer of the iceberg. As most of you probably know, iceberg videos are a sort of tier list where theories above water are topics which are well known, while topics deep beneath the water are less known and often much darker. That being said, we're not going to spend much time on the first tier because if you've made it to this point in the video, you'll know about all these. Mass botting simply refers to the large number of bots in the game, from simple scam bots to sophisticated bossing bots. Of the 100,000 people playing at a given time, how many of these are actually being played? Real-world trading of RuneScape GP is a major problem in the game, with some estimates claiming millions of dollars worth of gold are being illegally traded. Alongside real-world trade, you have the Venezuelan gold farmers. After experiencing hyperinflation, many people in Venezuela have turned to selling in-game currency in RuneScape and other games as a full-time job, despite it being a very bannable offense. You can find them at just about every boss in the game. To be fair, I should note that not every Venezuelan player sells gold, and Venezuelans are far from the only people who do sell gold. Without referencing any specific examples, there have been plenty of examples of content creators getting preferential treatment from Jagex, including drastically better account recovery, much greater leeway regarding bans, and overall better customer support. Failed skills refers to the three proposed new skills that failed polls and weren't added to the game, which includes artisan, sailing, and warding. Each of these skills had significant development prior to being polled, and elements of the skills could exist in past game files. Does this mean that certain accounts, particularly those of mods, could have secret achievements that we don't know about? Or could there be items that could be glitched into the game from these skills? The idea of a fake plague is a common real-world conspiracy, but in RuneScape a fake plague objectively happened, affecting the people of West Ardone. The hoax was held up by King Lathis of Ardone, and was confirmed in the Biohazard quest after he's confronted with the evidence. The King argues that it was for the good of the people, and was to protect them from a far greater danger. But, as we know, it didn't work out well for King Lathis, who was, shall we say, forcibly removed from power. The least exciting tier is done, and we'll now look at the second tier. We're still above water, so again, these will all be pretty well-known concepts. Mod flipping refers to the flipping or merching of items by mods in the time surrounding an update. Basically, this theory would say that once a mod hears about a future update that will lead to an item increasing in value, they'll buy a large supply of the item only to sell them for a much higher price in the future. This has been claimed many times in the past, really around almost every update. Ranged weapons, for example, saw massive flipping opportunity prior to the announcement of the blowpipe nerf. You also have the classic rock climbing boots conspiracy, where overnight an item valued at 12 GP was changed into something with a 45k ALK price. Of course, many mods could just conjure up GP, and most mods have the integrity not to do this, but it seems so easy to do that it's almost certainly happened at some point in the past. 13 different bosses drop a specialty jar, which is primarily used in the boss layer display of your player own house. These jars are all believed to have an easter egg associated with them. Zolra's Jar of Swamp, for example, has a reference to Shrek. Now, this is hard to explain in the lore of the game. How does Gilinor connect to these real world references? How do these small jars contain such a large replica of the boss? There's some mysterious power at play here that connects this world to that of ourselves, and leaves more questions than answers. The world of RuneScape contains quite a few areas which have been developed and are sometimes visible, yet completely inaccessible to players. And when an area is left unexplored, it leaves the important question, what is there? What could Jagex be hiding on this hill, or underneath the ground? 
It was actually really fun browsing through this list of inaccessible areas, so I included a link to an article on the Old School Wiki in the description. The Falador Massacre is always fun to talk about because it's one of the most well-known events in the history of the game, starting as bug abuse and later being referenced as part of Gilinor's in-game recorded history. The glitch occurred, in some parts of the world at least, on June 6th, 2006, aka 666, and allowed certain players to attack others in non-PVP zones without any fear of retaliation. Watching clips of the actual Falador Massacre taking place, you can see mods could do nothing but implore people to bank their valuable items. Reportedly, one player lost a green party hat, which in RS3 is currently valued at well over max cash. The bug was fixed shortly after, and players who PK'd a large number of other players were banned. Blacked out areas is the term that I used for the unknown, the literal edge of the world map. This is obviously ripe for conspiracy theories, especially since you can walk right up to the edge of the world. Is there a mystical force that prevents you from seeing across the line? Or is the world simply flat, yet with some sort of invisible wall put up by the wizards to prevent people from falling? If this is the case, how do you explain world expansion? In this spot, there's a literal bridge inviting you to fall off the world. Being able to directly interact with this unknown raises many questions, yet no answers. The Cold War quest is one of my favorite in the entire game. For those who haven't done the quest, or if you clicked through it too fast to remember, the quest is a satirical reference to the Cold War, involving a large number of secret missions and espionage to increase power over the world. And to top it off, the Penguin antagonists of the quest are the KGP, obviously referencing the Soviet Union's KGB operatives. The problem is, the quest line is completely unfinished. We didn't get any semblance of closure. The Penguins did not disband, and their plans were far from thwarted. We discovered they did in fact have plans to take over the world, and the quest ends with us simply escaping from danger. This means that RuneScape's Cold War is still very much alive, and the Penguins are an active threat to the world. The Rabbit Realm was temporarily added to Old School RuneScape for the 2020 Easter event. It is very similar to Gilinor, but run by rabbits instead of humans. It is presumed that the Rabbit Realm contains all the same towns and kingdoms as Gilinor, just smaller in size, although players could only visit a town called Bunbridge. This mirror of Lumbridge includes important NPCs as rabbits, such as Duke Rabatio instead of Duke Horatio, and Rabbit Chef for the Lumbridge Cook. If we have this parallel universe, which other universes exist? If you can simply substitute one species with another, surely we're looking at a massive amount of universes. If we lead this into a multiverse theory, where there are infinite universes, there would then be a universe where real, living humans are existing within a world highly equivalent of Gilinor, with the same skills, the iconic RuneScape cities, and more. Banked 580 was a simple phrase which at one time would get you automatically muted. It was supposedly a quick fix to mute scammers who would always use that exact term in their messages, but many innocent players got temporary bans because of it. Similar blacklisted phrases exist, and while JX mods have said that this method of simple phrase blacklisting was removed, I wouldn't necessarily trust myself to say it in-game. We're finally starting to get below water, but these are all still visible from the surface and are far from secret. Most of the entries on this tier aren't deep conspiracies, but are instead interesting tidbits with soft conspiracies that you could wrap around them. The Twisted Bow Spawn refers to an economy-breaking glitch that occurred in February of 2019. The Twisted Bow is one of the most valuable items in the game, consistently being valued around 1 billion GP. Yet this glitch threatened to change everything, as a T-Bow would spawn on the ground east of the farming guild every minute on every world. This glitch was live for 32 minutes, leading to hundreds or even thousands of bows to be obtained. The initial hotfix simply surrounded the bow with bushes, preventing it from being picked up or even telegraphed. After some time, Jagex decided to roll back the game to its state before the glitch, which was just the second rollback in the history of the game. Since then, a twisted bush has been added to reference the event, with a search option that reads, You don't find anything. Now the conspiracy here is that some people assumed the bow spawn was added intentionally for quick money, but again, there's probably better ways for mods to make money than putting a twisted bow on the ground in a new populated area. There are a number of things that aren't allowed in your RuneScape name. 
Certain character combinations are blacklisted, spaces, hyphens, underscores can't go at the beginning of a name, and you can't have multiple spaces in a row. Yet certain players throughout RuneScape's history have found a way to circumvent some of these rules. Some of these are still big mysteries, and those accounts are often sold given their rare name. Other secret names have since been found out. Crumb made a video recently about how to get a space at the beginning of your name, and because of that it looks like Jagex has since changed the rules and are now allowing that. But other names are still a mystery. In November of 2019, information leaked about another glitch that could have destroyed the RuneScape economy overnight. It was called the Duplication Glitch. Rendy played a big role in alerting Jagex of the vulnerability, and has a great video describing the glitch, which will be linked in the description. Basically, it involved overloading a server, causing it to forcibly crash. When the server crashes, it would revert your account to a save roughly 15 minutes earlier. If you had traded GP to another account during that time, and the account receiving the GP logs out, then back in, both accounts would have the GP in their possession when the world is restored. So basically, you could duplicate GP or any item in the game indefinitely if you could find a way to crash the server, which people found out how to do. Norse Code is a song in RuneScape which includes a very simple hidden message. The song title is a play on Morse Code, and the song uses long and short notes to spell out RuneScape in Morse Code. This is all fun and games, but what about other songs? Do they also tell a story beyond just being fun sounds? Is Sea Shanty 2 speaking to you? Telling you to risk your bank at the duel arena? You see, there are common conspiracies about backmasked songs, meaning songs played backwards that have hidden messages. So let's take a listen. Scambots use the player Buenos as part of their script, claiming that said player is their main as a part of the scam. If you've played RuneScape in the past two years, you've definitely seen this exact name. For those who might not be aware, the scam goes like this. The scammer says they are buying a valuable item for over grand exchange price. When you trade them, they'll say their main account is waiting at Camelot and offer to give you a teleport tablet to visit him. Their hope is that you'll accept the teleport tablet without removing your valuable item first, effectively trading a twisted bow or other valuable item for a 400 GP tablet. Most of these scams say their main is named Buenos, but in reality Buenos is most likely innocent just a random player who was picked to give the bots an air of legitimacy. Unfortunately, as a result, the player has become infamous with these scammers, and mostly a meme. The world of RuneScape is called Gilinor. As some of you may know, Gilinor is an anagram for religion. This isn't extremely surprising since the world is said to have been created by the three main gods, Saradomen, the god of order and wisdom, Zamorak, the god of chaos, power, and destruction, and Guthix, the god of balance and nature. But it has potentially large implications on a number of theories on this list, as religion is the center of most of the game's lore. Take a look at some of the items on the Tarn's Lair drop table. These are all dropped by zombies or skeletons. Some people have turned Tarn's Lair drop table into a satirical conspiracy theory of sorts, claiming that there must have been drugs involved when they created the drop tables. But the real theory here isn't if drugs were involved, but what happened in the history of this place to bring such an odd diversity of items. We can find a little bit about this in Tarn's diary. The area belongs to a dark necromancer named Tarn Razorlor, who became obsessed with bringing the dead back to life. The events in Tarn's diary took place after Mauritania was sieged by the vampires, so it's possible that Tarn invited people into his dungeon under the guise of safety from the vampires, despite really planning to use them as slaves and to experiment on. When they entered the dungeon, they brought along an assortment of items that they could carry, or maybe it was just drugs. There are a wide variety of theories that Jagex is somehow involved in the real world trade market. While the odds of this are slim, there are some legitimate questions here. One, why does it seem like so few players are banned for real world trading? Some say it's because Jagex owns the real world trading sites. Question two, how is so much money spent on gold? Supposedly millions of dollars of real world money are spent on GP, yet the player base isn't that massive. And three, how is there always relative demand for certain items? Most items are only needed to be purchased once, and while flipping accounts help offers fill quickly, 
there can't really be thousands of people actively trying to buy most items in the game at a given time. For some people, this can lead to the following solution. Jagex buys gold in order to purchase and destroy items to keep demand in the game. By this logic, extreme market crashes are caused by Jagex trying to slow this process. Of course, the odds of this are extremely low. While I like to be optimistic, I wanted to give these theories the benefit of the doubt and tried to do some digging into the gold buying websites. I looked at the technology profiles of some of the most popular gold buying sites and compared it to the technology profile of RuneScape.com. You'd assume that if Jagex operated one or some of these sites, you'd see at least some sort of overlap between the who is information, analytics preferences, advertising networks, email hosting, web hosting, or CDN. Unsurprisingly, I didn't find anything significant here, and I'm going to stop talking about it now because this is as close to drama as I want to get. On a much lighter note, did you know that there's a pet Bloodveld in Darkmire? Frank the Bloodveld is a very well-behaved pet, and you can even feed him raw and cooked mystery meat or blood pints. This means when you kill hundreds of Bloodvelds for a Slayer task, you are unfortunately slaughtering innocent creatures who just want someone to rescue them and bring them to a loving home. We're now on to Tier 4 of the Iceberg. This tier has a healthy mix of satirical theories, but don't let that fool you. The truth of Gilinor is getting a lot closer. It's Will is a popular content creator and self-proclaimed top 5 RuneScape player. But does Will have a secret identity? Everyone who's watched Will's streams knows that he shares a striking resemblance with a number of famous people, especially former NBA player Leandro Barbosa. Is it possible that Will actually is Barbosa? To start, we already have the stereotypical smoking gun evidence that the two have never been seen together. While that should be more than enough to convince you, I'm going to go deeper. Barbosa is listed at 6'3", but NBA players during this time were actually measured with their shoes on. This puts him in the 6'2 range, the same as Will. Barbosa is nicknamed the Brazilian Blur, while Will is known as Speedy Guy. The number most closely associated with Will is 7 for its Will 7. Well, Barbosa averaged 7 points per game in each of his first two seasons. Finally, Will is known as a top 5 RuneScape player, while Barbosa was a top 5 three-point shooter in the 2005-2006 season. If the resemblance and all these hard facts aren't for you, Will could be hiding another secret. How do you explain his resemblance to Ron Swanson, Borat, young Alex Trebek, Hopper, Nigel Thornberry, Tasty, or even Teddy Roosevelt? What do these men have in common? It's obvious. They're all Will. Could Will be some omnipresent, eternal, hive-minded super pro RuneScape player? Find out Tuesday through Sunday at 7pm Pacific. Let's stick to content creators for one more theory. If you've watched a Coxie stream, you've certainly noticed his signature bandana. That bandana hides a forehead tattoo, and it's one that suggests a dark secret. Now we all know that Coxie is now a reformed streamer who is never toxic, but it hasn't always been that way. After gaining hundreds of thousands of channel points and Coxie gripping until I could see the truth, I finally discovered what exactly Coxie is hiding. Underneath the headband is the infamous Mark of Zamorak. Zamorak is the god of chaos, power, and destruction, also known as the Dark Lord, or God of Dark Fire. His followers include the rulers who corrupted Mauritania, Dark Wizards, and many other antagonistic figures. Coxie devoted himself to Zamorak to give himself untold PVMing powers, which assisted him in being one of the first ever to all pets, and the first ever to achieve 48 out of 48 pets. We don't know what this implies about the potentially dark past of Coxie, but we do know that enough Coxie H's has helped distance himself from his chaotic past and into the light of reformed streamers. My favorite conspiracy theory in real life is that birds aren't real. And the more I looked at RuneScape, the more I became convinced that the same is true in Gilinor. The birds aren't real movement states that all birds were killed off years ago and replaced with drones which act as a mass surveillance system. In RuneScape, we know that some birds are real. Some are interactable with a clear purpose, like chickens, chompy, and killable seagulls. There are also huntable birds that drop actual bird meat, eagles for transportation, and a few more. But what about the birds that seemingly have no purpose? There's more than you think. There are cormorants in Karamja, Fossil Island, and Lake Mulch, crows in Lumbridge, drakes and other ducks in Falador and the Kren Woodlands, which ask, if it says quack, 
Gulls across the coasts of Gilinor. Pelicans in Karamja and Fossil Island. Pigeons in Varric. Puffins across Harmony Island. And swans in Falador. If their sole purpose is to make the game more immersive, then wouldn't they be modeled after the clearly fake real-world birds? Plus, we already have confirmation that birds in this game are used for surveillance. We've already talked about it on this iceberg. The damned penguins. It's right here in Sheepshear. They are watching us through the birds. Scale theory is a well-known and generally accepted idea which says that RuneScape is a fictional world being viewed on a scale. The fictional world is the enormous size that's described in the lore, but the version presented in-game is much smaller and has been scaled down just to make gameplay more possible. This scaled-down version shows you areas of the world that are of the utmost importance, while removing or condensing aspects of the world that serve little to no purpose. This theory is used as the explanation for why major cities are described as having many thousands of citizens, while only a few dozen can actually be found in-game. It also explains inconsistencies in distance, as stories describe weeks-long journeys to travel across the map, when a player can do it even without teleporting in just a few minutes. You also have situations like temple trekking, which don't appear anywhere on the map, but are obviously still in Mauritania. Now, the most obvious implication of scale theory is, what are we not seeing? It's presumed that anything important was maintained, but we don't know that for sure. There could be more rune rocks that didn't translate over, a new slayer monster, or maybe the love of your life. Another implication was too big brain for me, so I'll just read it verbatim and maybe you'll get it. The scale theory opens up some very strange possibilities, such as that the player is controlling a real person in the real world of Gilinor, but having the avatar presented to them in the game world essentially implying that the real world of Gilinor, the true real world, and the game world are three separate planes. The events happening in the real fictional world are occurring in the game world, but the game world is merely a sort of inner plane device presenting the real fictional world to the player in the true real world. That might make sense since it's on the wiki, but there are way too many quotations for me to handle, so it's up to you. Self-aware NPCs refers to all the in-game characters who seem to break the fourth wall. These characters seem to realize they're in a game, some of which resulting in bona fide conspiracy theories of their own, much more complete than anything that I've said so far. The Blue Moon Inn bartender is a great example of this, saying, The world around us is an online game, called Old School RuneScape. He then tries to explain the internet in layman's terms, and he is called completely crazy by your player. Other examples, the Lumbridge Sage, Father Eric, and Doris all seem to know too much. How do these NPCs learn this information but others haven't? Are they all part of some higher order? Or are they all just deranged conspiracy theorists? Wintertot's true form is a series of conspiracies which try to explain what exactly Wintertot is. The fire-making boss appears to just be an angry cold cloud. But it's such a far cry from other bosses in the game, so it's unlikely that it's just a sentient snowstorm. There's likely something controlling the Winter Tot, or at least a larger form beneath the ground. Since we don't get a really clear look at the Winter Tot, let's take a look around the room. It's pretty barren except for equipment, Arceus mages which seem to slow his power, and Bruma Roots. But why are Bruma Roots growing here? The only other place we know of Bruma Roots are in a very different environment being used by the Disciples of Yama in the Chasm of Fire. These Disciples worship Yama, who is described as a fire demon of great power, but is completely unknown in terms of his history. We don't know what Yama looks like, but we know the voice of Yama speaks for him, and that he's supposedly building strength. The Bruma Torches are a clear connection between two contrasting forces, fire and ice. Both are building power, and both are relatively unknown. So how are these two connected? Is Winter Tot somehow also Yama, who is not just a fire demon, but an elemental demon? Or more likely, are the two battling for some control over Zaya? This is one of the few big mysteries in Zaya which we'll talk about on this iceberg. Trojan Cow is a little different, as it was never mentioned in the actual game, but simply in the eighth post bag from the hedge. In it, Fred the Farmer says that the reason he needs all the wool in the Sheep Shearer quest is to build a Trojan Cow. Now that's obviously a reference to the Trojan Horse in the Iliad, which begs the question, 
What military alliances could Fred possibly have? And who could he be possibly looking to invade? This theory is in the very early stages of development, but there's one obvious conclusion. When introducing the Sheep Shearer quest, you can see that Fred is prone to believing conspiracy theories relating to the thing, the two penguins gaining intelligence. If he's prone to believing something like this and is quick to become unnerved, perhaps he's involved in the ham cult located in Lumbridge. The Humans Against Monsters members have long spoken of a way to destroy the goblins beneath Lumbridge, and the Trojan Horse could be their way to do it. With Tier 5, things are starting to get a little bit deeper. Most of these concepts require you to question things about the game, but we're not quite ready to see through the biggest lies just yet. Varric Fun's Dark Wizards is really just a meme, but it brings up a good point. The meme says, The King of Varric pays Dark Wizards to kill the poor and unskilled in order to keep them out of the city. Don't you think Varric's militia has enough power to wipe the Dark Wizards but decide not to? It's true that Varric is described as having one of the most powerful armies in Gilinor, yet they allow aggressive Dark Wizards to wreak havoc right at their southern border, killing thousands of low-level adventurers who try to enter the city. It seems plenty logical that the king made the political decision to limit immigrants in any way possible in order to avoid the potential toll on their great economy. Thorder's Truth is a secret which no one has talked about before. Thorder is a hidden NPC located in the Black Hole, only accessible using a disc of returning which can be purchased from Django in Drainer Village. The story in Old School is that Thorder used to run a business where he let people inside his Black Hole, but he eventually retired and just chose to stay in there. This area used to exist as a timeout for rule breakers, but is in the game right now solely as a throwback. There are obvious questions as to why or how Thorder owns a black hole, especially given its apparent proximity to the Dwarven Mine, which is underground, nowhere near outer space. Now you could say that it's just a very dark hole and not a cosmic black hole, but the stars around it disagree. This is a legitimate black hole in a secret location near the mine. Thorder manually enters the hole since he lives there, while players have to teleport in. This is important because no one knows what would happen if you merely appeared inside a black hole via teleport, whereas there are theories about what would happen if you entered a black hole. According to astronomy.com, if you jumped into the black hole feet first, the gravitational force on your toes would be much stronger than that pulling on your head. Each bit of your body would also be elongated in a slightly different direction you would literally end up looking like a piece of spaghetti. Knowing this, if this is what Thorder looks like when elongated, just how short is he without the effects of a black hole? Or has he simply adjusted to the astronomical mass of the black hole and is now unable to return to Gilinor without dying? But I think the most likely scenario is that Thorder enjoys being just kinda short, opposed to getting stepped on all the time. He now hides the manual entry to his black hole, forcing others to teleport in so that they won't become a lot taller than him once they enter. Xenaris is the Moon is apparently not a conspiracy, just canon, according to the wiki, but at first I couldn't find any in-game reference to this. I asked Mod Ash and he didn't know either. I looked through RuneScape 3 to the best of my ability and didn't find anything solid. I left the conspiracy alone for a few days, and the wiki had been updated with a very straightforward reference. Konar apparently says, Xenaris is the moon of this world. I talked with Konar and couldn't get her to say this, but we'll take their word for it. After all, the cosmic altar is here, and it has orcs, which are aliens from another game, so maybe that's good enough. So, if Xenaris is the moon, what questions does that leave us with? For one, why does Xenaris appear to be in a cave? What's on the surface of the moon that has forced them to move below ground? Two, where does the Xenaris Choir come from? While fairy magic can be used to explain a lot of abnormalities, is it actually strong enough to create humanoid creatures? Probably not, which means the moon is populated with humans. Is it then possible that many of the other realms and planes that exist in RuneScape are actually just on the moon? The Enchanted Valley, Fisher Realm, and Gorak Plane could be on the light side of the moon, which produces life and light at night while a dark side of the moon exists which is in tatters, slowly breaking off into space. This includes the Cosmic Entity Plane and the Killerwatt Plane, which sees the same storm clouds which occasionally pop over your head in Xenaris. This would then mean that fairy rings would only have to reach places in Gilinor or its moon, instead of traveling to alternate dimensions, 
which seems much more feasible. If it's canon that Xenaris is the moon, which it supposedly is, the existence of the Xenaris Choir proves that Gilinor's moon isn't some desolate place. Instead, it suggests we need to rethink the stories of realms and dimensions that we've been told in the past. The Wilderness Ship and Wilderness Volcano represent potentially the most unknown area in RuneScape. As stated on the wiki, nothing is known about it as it is not involved in any quests and currently no NPCs mention anything about it. So what is the purpose of this spot? The volcano itself seems to add some nice life to the wilderness, and at least it serves some purpose since you go there to create wilderness wards. But the ship brings about more questions than answers. Namely, why is there a metal ship when other ships in the game are made of wood? And how is the metal ship cut so neatly in half? My best guess is it was added for scenery, and the white flag suggests it could have been part of an advanced attack in the God Wars. Then, the ship was later planned to be a very high-level option for the sailing skill, offering fast XP rates at the risk of getting PK'd. Regardless of the sailing possibility, the ship offers insights into an untold story of a massive battle utilizing technology which was well beyond what was expected at the time. Ultra Growth Potion is short for Malignius Mortifer's Super Ultra Flora Growth Potion, which was created by Malignius Mortifer and sold to Weissen the Gardener to make plants in Falador Park sizable enough to resist destruction by the moles that lived underneath. The in-game story goes that one of the moles ate up anyway, and eventually grew to a ginormous size resulting in the giant mole boss. In RuneScape 3, the Growth Potion is also an obtainable item from the hard mode of the boss. Now, there's a couple of interesting notes here. For one, what else could this potion be used for in the wrong hands? We know that Weissen supposedly had good intentions with the potion, but who are we to believe him at his word? We've already concluded that Fred the Farmer is hoping to build a Trojan cow and might be a member of the Ham Cult, so who's to say that Weissen isn't teaming up with his old farming buddy Fred? Perhaps this potion is being used to create a super army to invade if the Trojan cow idea doesn't work. A second interesting note related to this potion is the giant mole's pet. This is called the baby mole, yet it's the same size as every other mole in the game. Has this potion altered the very genotype of the mole, so much so that all of its offspring will also grow to massive sizes? It sure looks like it, and that means Falador could have a big problem on its hands soon. Introducing Raids 3, Rising of the Moles. Muting First Amendment Claim is a real-world story of someone in Pennsylvania who decided to sue Jagex after getting muted in-game, claiming their First Amendment rights were violated and they were denied due process because they weren't given a reason. Now obviously this is pretty ridiculous, a private company can do whatever they want in their game, the American First Amendment does not apply to a British company, and due process can't be violated by a private entity, only by the federal government. After it was thrown out, he decided to try and sue again, this time citing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, which has nothing to do with this case. A photocopy of the actual complaint will be linked in the description if YouTube lets me, and it's actually pretty funny to read. I really included this because it kept coming up when I was searching for conspiracies, so I guess I'll try my best to make a conspiracy out of it. The judge in this case was the Honorable Mark A. Kearney of Pennsylvania's East District, he has extensive experience working First Amendment cases, and seems to generally limit the extent of power the amendment has, meaning he was the worst possible judge to hear this claim. Our poor gamer defendant was schemed upon by JX, who rigged the whole trial. I'm just kidding though, this lawsuit was obviously pretty ridiculous. The Tsar are a race of golem-like creatures that inhabit Mor Ul Rek, a lava-filled region beneath the Karamja volcano. If you've ever gotten your fire or infernal cape, you've obviously seen them but you might be doing a lot more than just seeing them. Let's start at the beginning of the life cycle, Infernal Eels. Zar are born from eggs which are incubated in birthing pools of molten lava, which you can see here. Well, we know these pools also contain fishable infernal eels. It's a safe assumption that these eels and eggs have a symbiotic relationship, mutually helping each other in some way. Well, eels are flagellates, a head being moved by a tail body. The same can be said of sperm. Could the czar be going to these egg-filled pools with a play czar? Similar to humans needing a proper temperature for fertilization, the same can be true for czar, and lava would make perfect sense given their heated nature. So as RS Captain Falcon confidently told me as soon as he could, if you fish for lava eels, you might be touching czar sperm. 
Now, after they grow into adulthood, there's another interesting thing that happens. When the Zard die, their bodies harden and lose all mobility, becoming Har Tok. Yet, even as their bodies fail, their minds remain eternally locked within their corpses, which are often displayed in a statue-like state or broken down into the holy currency known as Tokkel. Which means when you're given Tokkel after killing Jad or Zuck, you're being paid in petrified, still sentient Zar. We'll now look at tier 6. If you're playing RuneScape at the moment, I'd recommend you pay close attention to your character, because his third eye might be ready to open. Banzara is a hidden monkey NPC located deep in the arena where you fight the jungle demon in Monkey Madness 1. His examined text reads that he looks like a priest, and unlike all the other hostile monkeys of Ape Atoll, he appears to be understanding and sympathetic towards humans. When talking to him, he'll offer you a teleport. If you refuse, he'll tell you, we will meet again. There are plenty of questions with this secretive NPC. What is Banzara doing so hidden away? Unless you're looking for him, you have to be totally lost to find him. Why is it that he's so confident that we'll meet him again? And most importantly, why can we speak with him without the Monkey Speak amulet? With his priest-like attire and sympathy, he clearly has knowledge well beyond that of a normal monkey. Could Benzara be the future link to learning about Marimbo, the goddess of monkeys and apes which has been rarely referenced? If Benzara is a Marimbo priest who likes humans, perhaps he's waiting underground until he's confident he can change the troublesome culture of Ape Atoll. But that doesn't explain all the dead bodies around him. There's clearly two theories you can go with. One, Marimbo is just a helpful NPC who wants to change Apatol for the good. Or two, Marimbo is quick to teleport you out because you're hurting his mission of turning the apes against the humans. I'll let you all come to your own conclusion on this one, or maybe we'll just find out for sure in Monkey Madness 3. Glau is Glaufry is a lore-heavy conspiracy involving the history of multiple gnomes. We'll start with Glau. Glau is the villain from the quests The Grand Tree, Monkey Madness 1, and Monkey Madness 2, conspiring against his fellow gnomes in the hopes of destroying the humans and taking over Gilinor, using the monkeys on Ape Atoll to help him. Meanwhile, Glaufry was once one of the greatest gnome wizards of the Fourth Age, who left to found the gnomish city of Aprosandra, the Rock City. After killing the spirit tree Argento, he was banished, and gnomes began to distrust all magic users. Most of what is known about Glaufry is from the quest The Eyes of Glaufry. Now aside from the similar name, there's a few things that tie these two together. The first is personality. Both are shady and untrusted. The second, goals and motives. Glau hates humans and will step over his fellow gnomes to destroy them. Glaufry seemed willing to step over anyone and has reason to destroy the gnomes. Both also seemed to want to kill anyone who had more power than them, such as humans or a spirit tree. And three, most importantly, lore. In page 13 of my notes, you'll read the following phrase, which I won't bother trying to announce, but it's on the screen now. Using the Gnomish translation book, which is obtained during the Grand Tree quest, it roughly reads, The Eye of Glau, of the Guardian Tree Land for the idiot, no gnome but Glau has begun to become the Stone City Guardian. Eye of Glau. Not eyes of Glau free, but eyes of Glau. The rest of the sentence, meanwhile, is a perfect, albeit broken, description of Glau free, a relation to the Guardian Trees or Spirit Trees, one of which was killed by Glau free, leaving to become the Stone City Guardian, as in the rock city Aprosandra, founded by Glau free, Yet, in this passage, these are attributed to Glau. You can also find in Glau's journal some text that suggests he himself may have been spending half a century hiding underground. If these NPCs are the same, it may not be a safe presumption that Glau is now dead after Monkey Madness 2. If he's a powerful mage who survived since the Fourth Age, it appears his plans are just beginning. RuneScape used for money laundering is exactly what it says that people utilize video game currencies, including RuneScape GP, as parts of money laundering schemes. As most of you will know, money laundering is defined as the concealment of the origins of illegally obtained money, typically by means of transfers involving foreign banks or legitimate businesses. If you need a way to explain the origin of your money, the black market of video game currencies actually seems like an interesting route to take. 
It's easy to handle over the internet, and while it's against game rules, you aren't going to go to prison for real-world trading RuneScape GP. So concealing criminal activities like this is actually feasible, and could explain why so much RuneScape GP is bought and sold. Bugged Dry Streaks is a basic theory that your bad RNG is actually bugged, that you're actually unable to get the drop you're searching for. Despite being basic, it appears far down on the iceberg because it's actually happened. Five years ago on RS3, a streamer named Omid had an insane dry streak. He was searching for a 1 in 2,000 drop and hadn't obtained it in over 42,000 kills. The odds of this happening were estimated at approximately 1.77 billion. After a post on Reddit, a mod explained that an extremely specific glitch caused him to be unable to obtain the drop. As a result, they gifted him the item and the dev team fixed the glitch. While this was a very specific glitch that couldn't be affecting anyone today, it at very least suggests that other similar glitches are possible, and that just maybe, your dry streak could be caused by a glitch after all. Arceus Library Jail refers to a secret area located underground near the Arceus Library, containing jail cells and a coffin. The area has never been referenced in-game, and there's no way for players to access the area. It's only known about because it was discovered using an Oculus Orb, and otherwise, we never would have known of its existence. But who is this jail used for? There are relatively few jails in the game, and this is the only one I can think of that also has a coffin. The library's secret likely has some intended meaning since it was coded into the live game, and its mass secrecy with no visible entrance or exit means something truly terrible must be imprisoned inside. You can't have a conspiracy video without aliens. A number of posts have tried to pinpoint aliens in Gilinor with mixed luck. Perhaps the closest thing to aliens that have been found is the farming town of Hosidius in Karend. For one, we know a lot about the history of Karend, yet we don't know who the founder of Hosidius is, leaving it open for the possibility of an alien creator. The ancient machinery, meanwhile, is actually pretty modern, much more modern than what seems to be used in the area today suggesting that hyper-advanced machinery was used in the days of the Founder. Finally, the wheat field in Hesidius is capable of containing crop circles often associated with aliens. On a totally different note, in your POH you can create Rocknar, which spelled backwards refers to the large aliens in Star Wars, so you can literally create an alien in your house. And of course, aliens have visited Gilinar before, as you can see from this clearly irrefutable proof I found online. Next is human children. People love to talk about how old school is dying, but is it really dying? Gilinor seems to have a massively aging population, the likes of which the world has never seen. In the real world, about 25% of everyone alive is under age 18, but in RuneScape, well less than 5% of all human NPCs appear to be children. You can find some children in West Ardone, a town plagued with a fake plague but real malnourishment, some of the Varg newspaper who appear to be at the bottom rungs of society, the Taverly boy from the witch's house who is far from self-sufficient, and a few disturbingly happy children in the Varg museum. While you can certainly find some children in the game, a massive population decline is coming, which could spell doom for humans in Gilinor. Secret Page is very interesting, and I'm surprised it hasn't come up in a quest just yet. If you use a knife on the Karis memoirs, you'll receive a secret sixth page, which serves no immediate function. The examined text reads, an old page that had been hidden within Karis memoirs. The other five pages represent the five houses of Grey Karend, so my immediate assumption was that a sixth house used to exist but was destroyed in a war, or that it was a reference to Varlamor, the shining kingdom that is referenced in the southwestern corner of Zaya, but is currently blacked out. It seems like a potentially juicy conspiracy theory, but when you use the book with the sixth page on the Karend maid, Alyssa, she'll tell you a different story. The entry was written by former princess Rose, and tells a story of a corrupt Karen council who killed the most recent king and deemed Rose unfit to rule. She escaped before she met the same fate as the king. It casts the council in a very dark light suggesting they usurped the king and stole the kingdom for themselves, all part of a plan which has been around for decades. It does seem that Rose is still alive, and this storyline is far from finished. We're deep underwater at this point, reaching Tier 7 territory. 
We're starting to see some heavy lore here, but stick with me. Someone needs to hear these truths. I've already touched on the thought that other realms and dimensions may not actually be in other realms. And that idea will be important for viewing the Abyssal Area as the underworld of RuneScape. Let's start with what we know about the Abyssal Areas. According to the Abyssal Book obtained during the Enter the Abyss mini-quest, the region was accidentally discovered and believed to exist on a separate plane while searching for the source of Rune Essence. However, the person who wrote the book doesn't even know where wizards obtain their Rune Essence from, so it's safe to assume he could also be wrong about separate planes. The question is, if the Abyssal Area is some outside dimension that was only just now discovered by Dark Wizards, why is there a Fairy Ring? Clearly this area has some connection to life on Gilinor or the Moon, which fairies deemed important. The name of the Abyss and overall appearance suggests it exists deep underground somewhere, and the area is filled with aggressive demons. The book also references how the area appears to be encroaching on the real world. How could this possibly happen across planes? If the underworld is expanding, that could certainly affect the world above, but not a separate, unconnected dimension. We've even seen some of the abyssal areas already affecting the mainland, as abyssal demons can be found in multiple locations across Gilinor. Again, considering how weak the average monk of Zamorak is, it seems odd that they have the power to open a portal to another realm. But the center of the planet? That's a little more plausible. Also, it gets a little morbid looking into the known history of the Abyss. The Dark Mage which restores your rune pouches is actually trapped there with a mission, and he's never been fed because time moves so slowly. While this is stretching things, we do know that time does move slower the closer to the center of the world you are, and the magical effects of opening a portal to the area could compound this effect. And finally, the Abyss is a valuable hub of transportations to all the runecrafting altars which take you to areas around the world. This transportation would be a lot easier to explain coming from the center of the world, a sort of power source for the Rune Mysteries. RuneFest Stunt Doubles is the theory that certain members of the RuneScape community send stunt doubles to RuneFest. This theory exists because plenty of content creators will never show their face in their videos and streams, yet they'll visit RuneFest and appear to have nothing to hide. Are you trying to tell me they simply don't want to deal with a face cam? Nah, that can't be it, at least not according to this theory. It clearly makes more sense that someone with a similar voice was hired to go in their place, while they continue to hide their true identity behind the screen. The Eyes of Mauritania refers to the fail-safes that are put in place preventing you from accessing Mauritania before completing the Priest in Peril quest. In the quest, you need to rescue Drezel, a Ceridoman monk who has been captured by monks of Zamorak who have overtaken Paterdomus. The god affiliations are important because of the history of Mauritania. It was once a thriving area of lush flowers and large civilizations under Ceridoman, but has since been corrupted by the Zamorak following vampire overlords, turning everything into a swamp and destroying most cities. Now, if you're able to glitch into Mauritania prior to rescuing Drezel, two NPCs will repeatedly spawn. The first is Abador Crank, who tells you you'll never survive here and teleports you out as a supposed Good Samaritan. The second is a feral vampire who attacks you, resulting in a teleport out of the area. These NPCs constantly watch you, and can appear anywhere when moving in Mauritania. Abador Crank could be part of a Ceridoman resistance, spying on Mauritania and simply looking out for someone who hasn't yet proven himself tough enough to exist in the corrupted region, while the Feral Vampire is hired by Mauritania's tyrant Drakon to keep outsiders out. But why does this change after you free Drezel? Drezel's a Ceridoman monk, and saving him likely shows Abador Crank that you don't need assistance. But the Vampire. Is it possible that Drezel, powered by the infamous Temple of Paterdomus, is preparing a campaign against the Vampire Overlords and gives you a blessing that prevents them from teleporting you? If this is true, rescuing Drezel is the first step in finally liberating Mauritania. But whether or not you've completed Priest in Peril, you are still being watched. Every step you take. The Mysterious Stranger's plan once again takes place in Mauritania, so I hope you paid at least a little bit of attention for the last entry. This is a theory that actually seems to have future plans in the lore. So the Mysterious Stranger is an NPC who appears in two spots in Mauritania, the Hollowed Sepulchre and outside the Theater of Blood. At Sepulchre, the Stranger is a helpful NPC with an inventory of helpful supplies such as Hollowed Equipment. At TOB, he sells Verzix Crystal Shard, which allows you to teleport out of TOB and avoid death. Both of these are helpful. 
But the mysterious stranger also appears much earlier in Mauritania's lore, way back in the original God Wars. You see, as I mentioned before, Mauritania was once a thriving civilization living under Ceridomen, until it was corrupted and turned to swamp by Lord Dracon and his vampires. In the God Wars, a battle for Mauritania ensued named the Mauritania Campaign. At the head of the attack were the Barrows brothers, who had a reputation for near invincibility. As the brothers departed on the campaign, a mysterious stranger granted them near superhuman power to battle Dracon's forces by supplying them with the weapons and armor now known as Barrow's equipment. When the brothers died of infection from wounds, the mysterious stranger chanted in some foul, ancient language, casting his old magic. A vulgar purple light formed in front of him, fell to the earth, and bled into each of the barrows. This effectively sealed them to their tomb. Now, in the current day, it seems as if the mysterious stranger is once again trying to build a super-powered army, and perhaps revive the Barrows brothers to join in the battle. At TOB, he helps you to avoid unnecessary death with the teleport crystal. Meanwhile, he gives helpful gear a sepulcher, which is also in Mauritania. The mysterious stranger also has some very interesting lines of dialogue, saying, The theater is owned by Lady Verzik. I represent a party that has certain interests in Verzik as well as, enter the theater and beat the challenges within. Doing so would cause great embarrassment to Verzik, and my associates would very much appreciate it. At Sepulchre, he again says he represents a group who has interest in the power found down there, and again references needing talented individuals. So who exactly is the mysterious stranger? I've tried not to look to RS3 for many answers, since who's to say which parts of the lore overlap, but in RS3, there is an answer to this question. Sliske. He's a very powerful follower of Xeros with godlike powers who plays a big role in RS3. But again, there's no guarantee that things will go the same way in old school. All we know for sure is that they are planning to take over Mauritania. It could also be someone aligned with Drezel, maybe he's even closer to Sarah Doman, or even another antagonist set on capturing Mauritania for themselves. Odd Old Man is a Serial Killer is a potential easter egg noted directly on the old school wiki. The Odd Old Man is a very unusual NPC who is the central character in the Rag and Bone Man quests. In these quests, you need to collect a variety of bones for this creepy old man off to the east of Varric. While he claims to work with the Varric Museum, nothing about his setup backs this up. He gives dodgy answers regarding his bone collection, and seems to have something literally whispering in his ear. That something is stored in a bag on his back and is unknown to this day. According to the wiki, the odd old man could be a reference to an urban legend about an escaped mental patient named the Body Dismemberer, who carries a large duffel bag filled with bones, muttering that they made him do it. Now technically plenty of people in RuneScape are serial killers, but there's something different about this kind of killing. We've reached the eighth and final tier of the iceberg. If you've made it this far, take a deep breath because there's still so much more we need to discover, and I may have stumbled upon a unique discovery so big, it will change how you view a crucial aspect of the game. The Tool Leprechaun Conspiracy is summed up dramatically by a smaller YouTuber named Pelipper, and I don't want to steal his thunder too much, so I'm linking his video in the description, and I highly recommend it. The gist is, the various NPCs you pay to protect your crops aren't actually protecting them. The crops don't need protection, They'll survive unless something comes along to kill them. That something is the Tool Leprechaun. That is, one singular Tool Leprechaun, who has found a way to manipulate time and space to appear in multiple places at once. Now, he theorizes that the Tool Leprechaun has established a monopoly on farming, and profits off that by blackmailing people into paying for protection. If you don't pay, he just might kill your crops. But crops are far from his end goal. With powers like this, a greater campaign could be on the horizon. Again, his explanation and a deeper dive will be linked in the description. RuneScape.nyc gained some popularity as a conspiracy because it was included in the most popular conspiracy theory iceberg, as in an iceberg about conspiracies in general. The most likely theory this relates to is an extremely dark bombshell with massive real-world implications. The theory posits that a particular RuneScape server is actually the most advanced example of mind control in history. Now, the first aspect of this theory to know is that the layout of RuneScape's world has some overlap with the real world, in this theory, New York City. 
such as described on the pictured Reddit post, Single City is densely packed with multiple ethnicities on multiple islands in separate boroughs or kingdoms. Public chatter is ongoing 24-7, multiple methods to earn money from skilled labor, PKing, stock exchange, begging, and others. Holiday events at Times Square or Varick Square. Underground transportation systems. Impact of religion and politics on life, etc. Now, the theory goes much deeper than saying there's a correlation between RuneScape and New York City. Using a highly advanced network model, a researcher supposedly tracked the interactions of hundreds of thousands of users in MMORPGs, including RuneScape. He found that all servers showed basically the same results, all except one. In this one anomalous RuneScape server, users were rotating in routine micro-networks, only interacting with a few other individuals and never crossing paths with one another. Now, this same researcher was using similar methods to map the uses of a residential area in New York City. He noticed that the data he retrieved synced perfectly with the RuneScape network after obvious spatial translations and action equivalencies were made, such as grinding being working, scale theory, things like that. He did more research on different servers and cross-referenced them with various residential areas in New York City and created a map of areas which matched places in RuneScape. He attempted the same thing with other major cities in the area and other MMORPGs, but couldn't come close to replicating the result. The conclusion he drew was that one particular RuneScape server was being used to experimentally control a large population in New York City. Now, you could also view this as a potential surveillance operation, which seems more feasible than mind control given our current technology. This would allow the government or some other powerful body to easily check up on people if they know which character aligns with which person, seeing if someone is at work, if they're doing something potentially illegal, or spending all their money. Meanwhile, this is a tracking method that, unlike cameras and satellites, is pretty much untraceable and impossible to improve. Now, I've spent long enough on this, but I'll leave you with one more thought. How could this theory combine with the known botting or real-world trade epidemic? Are bots being controlled by the government to improve productivity, and that's why Jagex can be apprehensive to ban them because of government incentive? God is an Iron Man. It might sound crazy, but one Bible verse directly tells us that God is one with all Iron Man accounts. Now, I started looking into this theory by wondering why iron luck might be a thing. See, many people say that iron men are more likely to get lucky at obtaining rare drops, but it seems like an unnecessary complication for JX to change drop rates based on account type, so it just comes down to your RNG. Well, who can beat RNG? A god who controls everything. After all, as we've learned, Gilinor is an anagram for religion. We'll start with the first thing I noticed. Using the New American Standard translation of the Bible, which is the most common interpretation in my area, the word iron is mentioned 87 times, whereas main is mentioned a lowly four times. But it's time now for my smoking gun. It is in Deuteronomy 420, and no, I'm not kidding. It reads, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as today. So God took possession of all iron accounts. Now what does Egypt have to do with it? Well, in a different translation of the Bible, the New International Reader's Version, the same passage reads, Egypt was like a furnace that melts iron down and makes it pure. But the Lord took you and brought you out of Egypt. He wanted you to be his very own people, and that's exactly what you are. That just doubles down. Egypt was going to melt down the iron accounts and make them a main, but God said no. You are my fellow iron men. I won't allow it. And to top it off, we'll look at John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Wow. So if you follow God's footsteps and become an iron man, you'll be given more fruit. Fruit, of course, like fruits of your labor, referring to rewards. I'm not a preacher, so I'll just end it there. There are a couple of oddities surrounding Seracnus, the mid-leveled boss located in the Forthos dungeon. This dungeon is filled with easter eggs, but we're after much more than that. There are major secrets yet to be found in this area. 
Regarding Seracnus, many players have noticed that the body of Seracnus seemingly contains a recycled body of a chompy bird. Meanwhile, Seracnus has a few very notable drops. The first of these being spider carcasses. Seems to make enough sense, but why are these spider carcasses green when Seracnus and all the other nearby spiders are a burning red? And notice how it walks. The body doesn't move at all, not even a slight bend. It's all in the legs. It sure looks like Seracnus isn't really a spider, but was thrown together. Someone took the body of a dead chompy, merged it with the DNA of dozens of dead spiders, using some sort of ritual or magic to endow it with sentience. But who? Well, the answer lies in the underground temple itself, and it's right in plain sight. Here's the history of this dungeon. Forthos Dungeon is the origin of a religion dedicated to Raelos, the god of the sun. Raelos gives light to the world and seems to promote a very positive message to its followers. This is also the religion followed by the people in Varlamor, as mentioned earlier. Raelos also has a brother, Renewal, the god of the moon. Renewal is focused on embracing death, and while the message in the Tome of the Moon seems positive enough, there are underlying tones that raise red flags. The book reads, It is our duty to guide others in embracing death, suggesting they could lead people to an early death while also saying, we must treat them in death as they were in life. Which again sounds fine, until you look around the dungeon. This dungeon is filled with followers of Renewal. They're all corrupted, undead druids. Does treating people in death as they were life mean everyone needs to be reanimated? Keep this in mind, because now let's look at the altars. There are two altars in the dungeon, one devoted to Renewal and one to Raelos. The sun altar is destroyed, yet the moon altar remains. Beside it, a shaded beast has possessed an explorer and later cursed the altar. The shaded beast is in search of an ancient coin taken from Renewal's chamber, which suggests that he follows the moon god. All this put together starts to appear as if a big battle has taken place here, and the moon god Renewal may have claimed victory. The Knight of Varlamor and Brother Aemeri, also located in the dungeon, are visiting the temple because when Renewal was defeated, the prayers of Varlamor started to go unanswered, and they noticed that the Light's presence began to fade. But what does this have to do with Seracnus? Well, prepare for that jump. I believe that Raelos, the God of the Sun, was defeated by Renewal and trapped in the reanimated corpse that I described earlier. The fire of the sun turned the spider in chompy skin to a bright red, and a potion mixed in the cauldron by the undead druids gave its sentience and trapped him forever. We know that Renewal likes to keep people alive, and even the Knight of Varlamor blames Renewal's followers for destroying the altar. You can also see hidden passages around the temple and in Seracnus's lair where it could have been transferred. There's also the destroyed altar, cauldron for the potion, undead evil followers, needy Rolus worshippers, and a corrupted altar, which can only be cured by using dragon bones, which are coincidentally on Seracnus' drop table for some reason. Finally, it's noted by a Mary that only the power of Raelos can destroy Renewal's curse. But if Raelos is out of the way, no one can stop him. All this leads to just one conclusion. Renewal defeated Raelos and used his undead followers to trap him in a mismatched body that is now Seracnus. Seracnus is not a real spider. Seracnus is the god of the sun. Dark Altar is Alive has potentially massive implications for Karend, and I'm expecting it to be addressed further in the near future. When you look at the book Transvergence Theory located in the Arceus Library, you'll find an innocent enough description of the differences in runecrafting methods from Zaya to Gilinor. At the end, it goes in detail of the Dark Altar, with some dark descriptions of its power. The Altar is able to bring life out of death when reanimating corpses, corrupt individuals, and break minds. I think it's no coincidence that the Dark Altar allows blood and soul runes to be created only as these are primarily needed to reanimate the dead. It also notes that, by only being able to harness the essence changing power with Dark Essence, the Dark Altar has even more use and purpose. It's almost as if the Dark Altar has some sense of self-preservation, 
and is looking for as many ways as possible to be integral to our community and thus gain power within it. It ends by saying, the Dark Altar has the ability to merge power and dimensions, such as life and death, sanity and insanity, as well as converging the dimensions needed to craft runes, albeit with an agenda. Corrupt individuals, break minds, reanimate the dead, harness the essence, self-preservation, gain power in the community, merge power and dimensions such as life and death, and to top it all off, an agenda. This description makes T.O.B. seem weak by comparison. There's something legitimately sinister about the power of the Dark Altar, and it's believed to only be gaining power. Just like Yama and the Winter Tot, also on Zaya, could these three forces all be connected, ready to become the greatest force this world has ever seen? Or corruption? Merge life and death, sanity and insanity. We saw all of these just one entry ago. Renewal, the god of the moon who may have killed his brother. Let's forget about the Serachnus part for now, because at very least we can all admit there's plenty of evidence to suggest Renewal and his followers have done something to Raylos. But how would Renewal escape what seems like a tomb? Easy, the corrupted entry to the Catacombs of Karend providing easy access to the catacombs and all of Karend. Could it be Renewal who brought life to the Dark Altar, commanded Skatizo to betray his Zamorak followers and escape to Karend, provide power to the Winter Tot, and work hand in hand with the great fire demon Yama? If nothing else, seems like a much more enjoyable mega raid than my mole idea. And that is all I have for the old school RuneScape Conspiracy Iceberg. Most of the theories I talked about, I ended with more questions than answers. So if you want to learn more about any entry on this list, leave a comment and I'll consider making a deeper dive into the theory and its potential implications. If you made it this far, I want to say thanks. I haven't made a video game video in almost a decade, and I've never made a video anything like this. So I'm glad it was at least good enough to keep you around for a while. If you're interested in this kind of content, feel free to subscribe and give the video a like. Thanks again, and I'll see you all later.